Okay, hopefully it is recording. All right, so hello again. My uh, Monday name is Sarah Aerosmith. My SCA name is Anna von Arweiler. Uh, we are going to be learning about how to design targets for archery, for SCA archery. This is a little layout of sort of the things we're going to be addressing. I'm hoping that this uh, webinar will be interactive. So if you have questions, uh, please, you know, politely interject and, and say what you want to say. Uh, that way we can get feedback as we go. I will stop and pause as needed. But let's go ahead and get started here. Okay, so a little bit of introduction about how we run archery tournaments in the FCA. Um, there are some things that we try to uh, keep in mind um, while we're running a tournament and when we are preparing to run a tournament and designing it and deciding on what sort of targets we're going to be using. Um, the number one goal, I hope, with a lot of the things we do in the FCA is that it should be fun. Uh, that's kind of our goal. People come out, we want them to have a good time and feel good about doing archery and that they really got something out of the event. Uh, for that to happen, you have to cater to um, a bunch of different sort of skill levels. People come in to archery uh, with all kinds of different backgrounds and experience. So, so we want to make sure that our tournament is challenging enough for our more advanced archers, but still fun for maybe our novices and everybody in between. The tournament also needs to be long enough uh, that it gives everyone a chance to shoot and have fun, not too long that it keeps them from doing other activities that might be planned during the day, especially at a war. There's a lot of things going on, so we don't want to keep them from doing those other things. And then finally, um, if you are going up to a war event and you're planning this tournament, you have to keep in mind that some people drive very long distances to come for the tournament and it would be very disappointing if they only shot a couple of arrows and then they were done. So it's a lot to keep in mind, but things to think about while we're going through this. Our general guidelines are that we want to shoot between 40 to 70 arrows on six to 10 targets and the tournament should last between one and three hours. Um, keep in mind that at every end, typically people only shoot six arrows per end. So to give you kind of an idea of how long that takes. Per end? So an end is like a round. So people come up, they lose okay. six arrows and they step away and that would be their end that they shoot. Got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so before you can design a target, we need to understand what purpose it serves. Uh, what kind of tournament will the target face be used for? Now, there are typically two different types of tournaments, and I have seen these types used both at the same time, uh, which is interesting and fun. But we are going to mostly focus on scoring types of tournaments. Uh, the ones that our frequent Archers will recognize, of course, our royal rounds, which the SCA uses for our archery ranks. They are shot on standard uh, 60 centimeter targets at known distances. Um, our ICAC is an inner kingdom competition across all of the SCA. It's very similar to royal rounds and how it's conducted and the types of targets used. All of those types of tournaments, there are set scoring. So everybody knows how to score. It's all the same. Uh, what we will be focusing on this presentation is going to be scenario style targets where your target is not a standard round circle. It's usually some kind of drawing or painting. Uh, and we'll touch briefly on period style targets as well. And then of course there are non-scoring types of tournaments. So we see these as badge shoots. Um, the Barony of Aiton Belt and Sundragon is very famous for their bunny shoot on Easter. The idea is that you shoot a bunny, you get a bunny badge. There's no numbers involved, you win a badge. Um, we also have King Henry and variations of that theme. Uh, that is when you shoot at a known target and if you hit it, you're still in. If you miss, you're out. And then at each end, the target is typically moved back. 
Um, we saw this at Highland Wars where it was timed rounds and everybody shot as many as they could. And however many arrows hit the target, you got to keep. He moved, he didn't move the targets back, but instead limited the amount of time and you got shorter and shorter and shorter ends. So from 30 seconds down to five seconds and so on. Um, some scenario targets can be non-scoring. We'll see an example of that coming up. Um, and then we can have prize shoots. Uh, one of our more um, exciting prize shoots that we had, uh, Her Excellency Elena had done a Mother's Day shoot and she had pinned flower crowns to the targets. And if you shot inside the flower crown, you won the flower crown. So that's an example of a prize shoot. Okay, so we're going to start with scenario style targets. Um, usually they involve a picture, sometimes a 3D target. They typically have a theme. So all of the targets will follow some kind of like mythical creatures or um, at War of the Phoenix, we had the 100 Years War um, and all of the targets fit in with that theme somehow. Uh, they could include some period style targets. It could be a mix of scored or non-scored targets. And again, generally you have three to six arrows per end um, and may include speed rounds. So we have just this um, example that Mistress Caitlin did of kind of a big Viking boat and uh, the scoring for that. Let's see. All right, next. Uh, so one of our goals with the scenario shoot is that there's something for everyone. Uh, there will be some targets that are closer or further away. Usually for, near, for scenario style shoots, um, we don't tell people the distances. That's some, kind of the fun that we're not at standard distances. Uh, most of the targets need to have a scorable surface area that is relative to the 60 centimeter wide target uh, that we use the standard target. If you have really tiny pictures, it makes them really hard to hit and not as fun to shoot at. Um, let's see, we also like, we typically are very trained to shoot right in the middle of our target, um, which often causes our targets to blow out in the middle. So if you're planning a tournament, this is sort of an opportunity to put your high scoring areas in other places besides the middle to spread out those areas. Usually we have a lot more people shooting at a tournament than a normal practice, and it's a way to preserve uh, the target butts. Um, and then the next thing about the you know, the particulars of scoring is that every target that is put out should have relatively equal maximum point values. So when we do Royal Rounds or ICAC, typically the maximum amount of points you can get on any one target is 30 points with the highest individual arrow being five points. So that's sort of what we want to gauge our ideas for scoring to be around when we design our actual targets. Okay, so I have some pictures of some targets that were made. Um, if you look at the ones on the left here, these targets are probably pretty far away and they're really pretty big. Um, when the targets are further away, you want your scoring areas to be larger and probably more simple. So you're not gonna have like one point here and two points here and three points here. It's usually all of the top is three points and all of the bottom is one point simplistic because it's so far away it's hard to see and it's hard to hit um, when you move targets closer you can have more difficult and more creative ways of scoring okay so for example uh, this is a scenario style target if this target was up close you can see how big this is compared to mistress caitlin it's almost as tall as a normal person um if this was really close at say the 20 yard mark, which is our closest target for Royal Rounds, you could have scoring at five, four, three, two, one and have really specific places that you want people to hit. 
uh, because it's close up and you can see it. And most people have okay aim-ish at the closer distances. Now, if it was further away at 30 or 40 points, you might consider everything above the belt here to be five points, everything below the belt to be three. And if you just hit the face of the target somewhere, you at least get one point. So with that in mind, your highest scoring areas should be equal to or greater than the gold circle in a standard 60 mil target, a 60 centimeter target. So if I were to estimate, and I think my video is still showing, it's about this big. Um, and you want it that big because that is the hardest area to hit and you want to give people at least some kind of chance to hit it. So moving on. Now, it is very popular to have negative points on a target. Uh, this is something that's kind of fun. It gives people a chance to sort of think about where they're aiming so that they don't hit something that's going to take away from their score. Um, a very standardish type of idea for positive and negative points will be like positive points for hitting the bad guy who's holding you know, the maiden hostage. And of course, if you hit the maiden who you're supposed to save, you lose points. Um, we try to limit the amount of negative points you can get. It really kind of sucks coming to a shoot and only getting negative points and being the most negative person there. Not so great. So we try to avoid that. So really you can do things like, well, if you hit the maiden the first time you lose points, but if you continue to hit her, there's no more detriment to your score. Um, you want multiple high scoring areas. So instead of just one place where you hit and you get points, there could be a couple of places that are worth a lot. So in this example, this was painted by Master Johan, this soldier. Um, the yellow was the highest score, uh, followed by the face, and blue was the lowest score. Okay, which brings me to my next point. So we have often at least one target in a tournament that has what we would call a luck shot. So it's really a very, very challenging place to hit that most people wouldn't. But if you're scatter shotting the target, you might get lucky and hit something that is worth a lot of points. So I have an example um, for this target down here. You see these jewels. Really, if you're aiming down here, you're more likely to hit the white and get no points. But if you're really lucky, you might get 10. A normal standard archer would probably just aim for somewhere on the chest because you're more likely to get at least some score rather than none. Uh, similarly, uh, this uh, target, this D&D target, same thing. So the body was worth a lot of points. The head was worth some points. And then this orb, which was a really small area on the target, was worth 10. Now, we also want to keep these to a minimum because you don't want to have a target where all of a sudden you just totally overcome all the archers because you happen to hit a luck shot multiple times. It makes it feel like there's no point to shooting on other targets at that point. So you want to make sure all your targets have something fun to hit and that one target isn't overwhelming your score with a lot of points. So here's an example of a non-scoring target that was used during a scenario shoot. So this target was created by Captain Benedict in Twin Moons. Uh, he said you could shoot at this target at any point during the tournament. However, it was about winning or losing arrows. So if you hit the money bag, you gained an extra arrow. So every arrow you hit on the money bag was an extra arrow that you could use on every target for the rest of the tournament. Now, if you hit the Baroness, Her Excellency Elena, or the cat, oh, that's perfect. He just entered the room while we're talking about him. If you hit Elena or the cat, you lost an arrow. So it was a little bit of a gamble because if you lost arrows, then you had less arrows to score with for the rest of the tournament. So some people who are really brave shot at this at the very beginning to try to gain arrows. And some people waited to the end because they were worried that they would just not have arrows to shoot with. So uh, is Business Cat talking about a butt? That's supposed yes. to be represent the archery butt? Okay, good job. Good job. So, um, so let me tell you a story. 
<laughs> yes, go ahead, Your Excellency. So I ran an archery carnival. Uh, I wanted to run an archery carnival and I wanted our tagline to be, our archers need new butts. So we, I proposed this to Captain Business and he was like, I don't know about that but we did it and then it was lucrative. So this is him uh, being like, what is this about archery and butts and buying all these new things? And then I'm talking about a carnival and tickets and making money. And so that was the joke. It's really cute. I, I, I support it, cousin. I support it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, this is definitely like the Elena slide because these beautiful targets down here, the flower targets were also painted by Elena for our first Mother's Day shoot. Uh, this was also an example of non-scoring because if you hit one of these flowers on your first arrow of the day, you got a gold badge painted on a leather thing. And then you got, I guess, six more arrows. And if you hit it with the other six, then you got another badge so it was a badge shoot uh, similar to the bunny shoot that eight and Vault does so as you can see there's different ways to incorporate different styles of targets and and how you use them oh no what did i do crap there we go okay so now you guys have some of those ideas brewing and we'll come back to ideas. We wanna talk about what kind of materials we're actually using for the target faces themselves. So the standard size of our targets for Royal Rounds and ICAC, which is what most baronies have for their butts, the foam backing are usually two by two. So that covers our 60 centimeter targets. Um, if you are wanting to make a target, you're really going to try to want to fit your paper or whatever on that. Now, other baronies do have other size butts um, that you can use. For example, in this uh, picture, we have our target round, our straw round, which is a little bit bigger than two by two. Uh, so that's something to consider. Um, the materials. So most of our target faces are paper faces that are painted, drawn, whatever we, we um, in our group, we have a projector that we project on the wall and then you can, you know, trace the picture. Um, and then it's with spray adhesive sprayed onto and attached to a piece of cardboard. And then the cardboard is pinned to the target butt. Um, another thing you can do if you're not particularly artistic uh, is you can cut out images that you print um, I thought this was very clever. Elena, who's a wonderful artist, don't get me wrong, she got this really big image of the dragon and she cropped it and printed, had it printed on full size sheets of paper. And then she just taped all the paper together to make this really big print of the dragon and then put that on cardboard. So that you, you know, you wouldn't have to go and paint that. And then it's hard to tell in this picture, but then she outlined the scoring area of the dragon in a black Sharpie marker which was just the body. We we're trying to hit the body of the dragon. Um, you can do targets with acrylic or marker. Um, some of our War of the Phoenix targets were made out of bed sheets that were painted. I highly recommend putting cardboard underneath the bed sheet while you're painting, unless you want to also paint your table. Um, and we also have canvas. You can paint on canvas. So there's lots of different things that you can paint on. Um, um, is there... Uh, if I'm not going to use a bed sheet, maybe I'm not going to use canvas, but I am looking for some sort of fabric. Is there a fabric that we shouldn't use that would potentially uh, harm our equipment, the arrows, or is it pretty standard, doesn't matter? Um, I would suppose the arrows will probably go through most fabric. Most fabrics. That Nothing that said, I, I would suggest using a cotton-based fabric. If you're using something like heavy upholstery, I assume that the arrows could bounce back. Not that we've ever tried, but um, a light fabric is fine. If you're trying to do it on like cotton gauze or something, it might just tear apart and fall apart. So I would say standard fabrics like bed sheets, cotton, 
fabric is probably the best. That might I be a fun test. I um, can I interject? Yes, please. Um, I I have been victim to uh, silk banners. And um, I won't go into that at this point, but um, I shot a uh, silk banner twice and the arrow did not go through. So okay. careful with silk. And that's what I was just gonna mention. It might be a cool test is the say, I, they say the Mongols wore silk jerkins underneath their, or silk under their leather jerkins. And when the arrow penetrated the leather, it wrapped into the silk. And they could pull the silk to pull it out of the wound. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So not but anyway. We, we digress. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Well, silk is kind of a. I wouldn't do silk. Okay. Besides being too expensive. Oops. Got you. Thank you. Okay. So another thing we want to consider is after. After you've painted this really cool target, you want to make sure that your target has very clear scoring areas. There's nothing more frustrating than not knowing what to hit. <laughs> um, or if you've hit something, having to have a marshal come and make a judgment call. So we want clear scoring areas, usually a nice thick line around each area um, that's less than the width of your arrow, of course, so you can tell which side your scoring goes on. Um, and you want it to be sort of obvious where you're supposed to be hitting. So I have another example of business cat here. This was my favorite shoot, by the way, Captain Business's shoot, it was great. So he's got these ties and the color of the ties followed the standard uh, colors of scoring. So the bow that's yellow is five, um, Black was two, blue was three, red was four, four points. So it was very intuitive. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Captain, but if you hit the cat, you got minus points. Um, here is an example of an interesting, um, an interesting target uh, that we've, I had approval to talk about this because it's a great learning experience. The tree is very easy to see, has very clear deviations of where you should be aiming with the star and the tree. However, the ornaments on the tree were big close up when you're painting it, but when we put it out at 20, 30 yards, suddenly those ornaments were really hard to see in their color and they were really hard to hit. So that was something you might want to think about is usually when you're creating the target, oh, it looks really big as you're painting it. And then when you put it out um, at a distance, you realize, oh, this is actually much harder to hit than I thought it was going to be. You and Samuel is. The rest of the shoot was wonderful, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it did. I mean, doing this the way that it was really uh, inspired me to do things differently later. So it just improved all of my uh, later shoots, you know. Okay, so I wanted to just show some 3D um, examples of targets. And here again, Her Excellency Elena again, because she's amazing. Um, we did these hanging pinata style targets, which were a ton of fun to hit. The way these were constructed was cardboard boxes with plastic bags on the inside. Sorry, I don't know why that disappeared, uh, which was great. And so when you hit them, because it was swinging, then it would move. So you'd have to sort of either wait until it stopped moving or continue to try to shoot at a moving target. So that added a whole other level of interest to it. Um, those of you who shot with Master Johan, he has his 3D imp and I believe imp badges that go along with it. This um, sort of pear shape target is a traditional uh, period style target that was usually put out, you know, at like a hundred yards or much further distances. And the idea was that you uh, hit inside this circle. And there's particular rules associated with that. We have these sort of strange looking men. Um, these types of targets were ones that were put on like a track and they were pulled in. So you had, 
you know, a certain amount of time and you had to shoot as many as you could at the moving target that was moving closer to you. So your distance was changing, your gap that you had to shoot would change. So you'd have to accommodate that. Uh, this interesting thing down here in the corner was actually like a revolving target. So again, moving targets are kind of interesting. I believe that one was shot at Penzik. Okay, so now we're moving on to um, some of the targets that I've, out of just personal experience, kind of really enjoyed shooting at that were sort of diff different and interesting. Um, of course, the famous Red Solo Cup Challenge the challenge here was whoever could shoot the least number of arrows and then hit the cup, which of course was shot on the first arrow by one of our youth. So we all got creamed on that one. Um, this was a timed round up at Highland War that Captain Chang put together. So it was an orc. Uh, this was from the champion shoot put on by Master Johan. So some different things. Uh, flowers, again, it's a theme for us in Twin Moons. We love our Mother's Day shoot. Uh, this one was at Phoenix War, but I, Camille, we also shot at this at Polaris last year, didn't we? I think so. Some of the mythical creatures. Um, this one was sent in from Barony of Triscothir. And then here's an example, again, of... Uh, the good guy, bad guy type shoot. So if you hit Humperdink, you got positive points. If you hit Princess Buttercup, you lost points. More mythical targets. This was one that I painted for Phoenix War. This is a good example of this was a really, really big target. Um, I think it was like three feet by four feet. And we put this at a really far distance. So between 30 and 40 yards. And the scoring was very much, you hit the dude above the belt you got five points hit the dude below the belt you got three and if you hit anywhere on the white you got one point point. and for those who shot at the novice tournament over the weekend one of the dragons i really like this target you can see that there's some outlining on it and then one of our fan favorites here in twin moons is that we play poker in blackjack oh go back here we go um and that's fun we put this target up pretty close at between 10 and 15 yards and these are oversized poker cards and you get a single end and that's your game hand that you play so i hope this is sort of spurring some different ideas about sort of different kinds of targets you can do and now everybody else gets to talk. So my first question of the evening, and I'm sorry people putting stuff in the chat. I can't see it while I'm sharing the screen. Um, are what were some of your favorite shoots and why? Um, so let's start with that question. If anyone wants to just chime in. Anyone? I didn't shoot at it, but one of my favorite to watch several years ago is somebody had um, a mannequin basically posed as crawling on the ground and you were, uh, it was a scenario shoot and you were trying to shoot the soldier that was crawling on the ground trying to creep towards you and that was kind of cool. Very cool. I like to there was always a theme, whether it was the Dungeons and Dragons too, it was the Bunny too. It was give me, give me something or someone to prove. It's always a good one. Okay, you were a little cut off there, Rashawn, but I think I heard something about a bunny shoot in there. Yeah, I like the I like the Bunny shoots, and like any of the shoots where there's something to hit, whether it's the D and D shoot, whether it's the Bunny shoot. Trying to shoot that gift that was like off the ground. Oh, hold on, fifteen. So all the all the things to shoot at, like when they're particularly themed, is fun. Yeah, I think that's what I got from what we're saying. Mm -hmm. So the themes, those theme shoots. Okay. Um, one of, oh, sorry. One of, Go ahead. Go ahead, Katie. 
one of uh, it wasn't one that I shot at, but I had taken my grandson to Highlands and he's just starting into archery. And I liked what he did with the youth because everybody got points, which when for especially younger kids, they're just learning to shoot and they get discouraged because you know the older kids are going to shoot well and usually win the tournaments. But when they're younger, if at least they get points, they get excited about hitting the target and getting some points. And I really thought that that shoot was a really good shoot for the youth at Highlands. Well, thank you. Awesome. What, what, how did that work? I heard everything except for like what, I don't understand what the shoot actually was. It was uh, characters from Lord of the Rings and, and it was outlined. So even if you hit outside of the, the black lines of, for points, sometimes you'd at least just get one point. So you might, okay. they had the Corsairs. So if Got you it. shot on the little Corsair, you might get one point, but if you shot the sails on the big Corsair, you might only get just one point, but at least the, the, especially the younger kids were getting points and getting very excited about getting, getting points. points. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Uh, my next question are, what are things we should avoid shooting at? Mm. Live people. Live people, yes, thank you. Metal objects. Metal, Metal objects. objects, yes, indeed. Birds. Birds, okay. But in terms of like target... A target design, let's think about that itself. So one thing, like we did a, like a holiday shoot last year. So I had to kind of think of like, you know, which holidays are we representing and are we representing them in a respectful way? So I actually, I, we have a few people that were Jewish that were coming out to our holiday shoot. I wanted them to feel included, even though I was doing like a Christmas tree and you know, other stuff like that. But so I actually asked him, hey, would you design a, like a target that um, like you could run that people could shoot at and like add to their point sheet, that sort of thing, because I didn't want to shoot at imagery that was going to be more hurtful than fun. That makes sense. So along that line of reasoning um it was oops sorry uh also oh backs my screen just doesn't want to cooperate um maybe avoiding shooting at baronial arms so like don't use the twin moons populace badge or uh try not to shoot at a flag of Aitenveld. Um, or if you are going to have those sorts of things on your target faces, uh, make them worth negative points or that sort of thing. So we did have a shoot that had the sun of Aitenvelt on it in the middle. And the objective was, is if you hit the sun, you lost points. But if you hit anywhere around, around the sun, you got points. So to kind of being respectful of certain imagery is always a good idea. Um, and then, of course, making sure your target faces aren't made out of a material that is going to damage our arrows. So if you're building moving targets, for example, and you need them backed by wood, making sure that you have enough foam in your cutout that we're hitting the foam and not something, you know, like a four by four, et cetera. Um, my next question here is anything you've made that just didn't work at all or a shoot that you've been to that didn't work at all and what can we learn from it and I know I've done a lot of talking but I wanted to give an example of I had gone to a shoot and I feel like I'm an okay archer but I had gone out of the tournament with negative points and I was like wow that's really exciting you know so it we try to avoid that sort of thing but um Anyways, so if you guys have sort of ideas to throw out there, like what are maybe some things that just didn't quite work out and what would you have changed if you could go back and change things? Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. So I haven't done very many of these things, but um, the one target that 
gave me fits out of all the ones that I've shot at so far was the one at the I want to say it was that Hawaiian theme shoot where it was just a it was a wreath of like flowers and shells and even though it was close the colors were really um pale and the items were a little bit small so I know like just looking at it it looked great but coming from the perspective of being new to shooting it was really hard even in a closer range it was very difficult to hit those and I lucked out and hit one but it was total luck <laughs> absolutely pure luck um but yeah that's probably the one that I would probably like make either brightening the colors up or making them a little bit bigger probably would have helped just because they were like quite small and some of the colors were more pastel. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And thank you, Nix. Anyone else? I don't have one. Um, maybe I can interject here that uh, okay, so you have hand bowmen and you have crossbowmen. You will find that some tournaments heavily favor one or the other. So crossbowmen are just really particularly good at hitting really tiny areas like repeatedly. Like once they sight out the distance, they have better repeatability typically than a hand bowman would there's it's just sort of how things are and so we usually say that time drowns are the great equalizers of archery so sometimes if we have crossbowmen and hand bowmen competing together we like to throw in a time drown to sort of give the hand bowmen some shot at winning against a crossbowman because let's be honest our crossbowmen win a lot of things because they're awesome and it's crossbow. So, um, however, uh, we've learned very quickly in our barony because we have a lot of crossbowmen and we have a lot of handbowmen, we have a lot of archers, is that if you have one target that is a timed round, it takes up a lot of time to get everybody timed and it creates a bottleneck and and then it makes it harder for people to finish shooting because everybody you're gonna have to count that 30 seconds out for 40 some archers it's going to take a while to get through even if you double up so that's something if you're going to make timed rounds either have multiples of the same target or just think how can i change this so we're not bottlenecking um another thing that i wouldn't say that it didn't work because i really liked the idea but it was another case of bottlenecking uh, was that we had a tournament where for a single target, we were put into groups, small groups of, you know, three or four people, and we were to shoot at a target together. And that total score uh, for killing that target was then added to our individual scores. So it was an idea of like teamwork, which was wonderful. Um, the issue came where, again, you had to wait, you know, we had six or seven groups of people we have a lot of archers and twin moons and so we had to it took at least six or seven eight ends to just get through all of the groups shooting at the single target so again that was a bottleneck of where it really drug out uh the shoot and at the end everybody was done shooting at their individual targets and they had to wait a long time for their group to go up and shoot together so that might be something that we could also learn from, which by the way, group shoots are really cool. It is fun to shoot as a team for a total score and to win together as a team. So that part I really liked. Okay, so favorite themes, go. Well, d d was wildly popular for us. I planned it for about 20 and then we had about 40 show up. So. <laughs> That crazy bottleneck with that dragon was definitely a, a product of having twice as many people as I thought we were going to have. Yeah, so what was cool about that D&D &D shoot, Elena? What, what did we do at the beginning of it with classes and stuff? Oh, so I made everybody uh, like declare a class like on their sheet at the beginning. 
And uh, Volchek and I had just talked it through like the night before and decided on like one little like advantage depending on what they chose. And so I made everybody choose. And then I went through and like announced and told people like what their advantage was gonna be. So it could be like, you get an extra arrow against this monster because they were all different monsters. Um, or uh, the rogue I think was like once per like once per shoot, you could just walk up and stab an arrow into one of the monsters wherever you wanted it to. Um, there were just different funny, like things that went along with each class. Volchek came up with most of them because you know he was like really into the whole D and D thing too. But um, that just kind of like added an extra little like something at the beginning that people were, "What did you pick? What did you pick? What's your advantage? What did you get?" Like that was kind of fun too. Thank you, Your Excellency. Okay, favorite themes. Who else? Okay, how? Oh. Go for it, Katie. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I didn't get to do it this year, but because I was sick for it. But my favorite, I'm from Sun Dragon, and I like the bunny shoot. I've, I've done it over the years, and sometimes I get bud badges for hitting the bunnies, and then other times I get a, a, a no bunny badge for missing <laughs> them all. So, and I have more misses than I do hits in the past. Ah, that but... vegetarian badge haunts <laughs> yeah. me to this day. But um, that's always been a favorite shoot of mine is the bunny shoot in, at, um, with our group. Thank you. How about Paul and so, Kamir? You guys have put on a lot of shoots. Our favorite shoots are the ones that people have fun with and we never know really if they're going to enjoy it or not. We try to make it so that the novice can participate longer than they think they're going to. And yet the experienced ones will have something to hone in on so that they can say, hey, I'm better than I thought I was. Um, but we've done a lot of them and you know, there's so many of them that are so much fun. Um, Some of our ones we've we've had not to worry about so much about scoring is like the King Henry type shoot where you get the arrow back if you hit it. So you go further and further and further back. So somebody who's brand new when we're only at 10 or 12 yards, they can hit that maybe up to 15, even up to 20 yards. So they're still having fun. However, when it gets further away, when you're down to 40, 50, and 60, 70 yards, now you're only you're you're down to the really, really good archers. So you get a really good winner uh, without a scoring sheet. And you also have a lot to for new people to play with before they're eliminated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, I think I interrupted someone who wanted to talk. So go for it. Be aggressive. All right. So can, hopefully you all can hear me because uh, yep. I've actually got two. Uh, obviously, last year, the uh, fundraiser shoot we did the archery carnival that was a blast just the different target types and just going out there and having fun and not really caring about who won or lost and then i saw nix's message about a halloween theme shoot last year's one that tibor did i had a blast at especially one of the targets that he had out was literally the giant skeleton that we were shooting at Yes, that was awesome. Tibor is famous in our barony for putting on really fun shoots. We really like him. I mean, we like him anyways, but his shoots are particularly fun. Okay, so I hope that this gave everybody some ideas about target making. Um, of course, thank you to Barony of Twin Moons and uh, those across the kingdom who provided photos for me to 
put in the presentation and of course the Barony of Granite Mountain for hosting this class. Um, I wanted to turn the time over to uh, Her Excellency to talk about what they're looking for for Polaris and the captain archery captains for um, Granite Mountain are also on the video tonight. So I will turn it over to you guys to talk about what you're hoping for for Polaris. Do we want to keep the recording on or do we want to turn it off so that future uh, people yeah. watching this don't need to hear all of those things forever? 